Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Have two announcements to be made. I want to save them to now. The first announcement is: Do the rest of you guys think you're still 18 years old? <laughs> My mind says I'm 18. My body does not. I try. Second announcement is, and by far the greater announcement is, next Sunday we'll be opening up Sunday night services in person. Um, it'll be at 6 o'clock here. We're very excited. That means we will be fully back and open for all services. So that's very exciting. We're, I'm, I'm ecstatic that we are able to do that. And it's very, very good. Hope to see everybody on those nights. Um, when we start, we're going to finish up uh, Mike's class that he's been teaching online first. Then we'll go and have a singing night, and then we'll go into sermons. But every fourth Sunday of the month will be our singing night, where we just come and sing. And that, and more than likely, when we start back fellowships, that'll be our fellowship too that time, either after morning services or for dinner before we sing. Um, I like to make the song leaders full. So they have such a good time to get that air out for all those songs. So, but, yeah. Um, today's sermon is, what are you seeking? In the introduction in John 1, 38, Jesus asks a question that should be really thought-provoking. And that question is, what are you seeking? I feel pretty comfortable in saying that every person in this room is seeking the same thing. I don't believe any of you made a wrong turn on the way to Cedar Point this morning. I think you meant to be here. I believe you're here for a couple reasons. One is to, for us to come to this earthly place to worship collectively together. And the second is to continue our trip on our way to heaven. And we come together to strengthen that trip. I believe every human being has an internal something that they're trying to seek out. They just don't know what it is, a lot of people. But it's internal. We've always sought things out. If we go all the way back to when America was founded, Christopher Columbus was seeking a route to India for spices. When we settled the colonies, they were getting away from religious persecution and seeking a place where they could have freedom through to worship God the way they felt right at that time. And as we expanded, the covered wagons didn't go across America just for the fun of riding in a covered wagon. They were seeking land. We go into outer space because we're seeking what is out there. Man has a internal clock or internal something or other inside of you that makes you seek. And oftentimes, people really don't understand what they're seeking for. If they would seek for God first, everything else would be fine. But that's, the, that's what we're going to talk about. I want to dig into this question by giving out, the th you know this already, the way that God wants it done, and then three points that will help you on your way to that heaven while we're on this earth. So, first is, what does God say? The second is, what is the church? Third is brothers and sisters. And the fourth is relationship with Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Let's begin the lesson now. What does God say? Romans 10, 17. I'm going through the steps because I believe this is so important here this morning. I know you guys know them. I know that we've done it. But as I talk to people throughout the world, they just don't see it. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on what God says, not what man says. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must first hear the word. What does that mean? We must first hear about Jesus. As we're studying in John, the first five verses of John basically tells you what the word is. It was with God, it was in the beginning, it was not created, it was there, it created. Jesus created. People don't wanna hear that because they feel they're the ones that create things. We don't create anything. We use what's already been created. 
We create nothing. So you need to learn who the Word is, and that's Jesus. And that's why people try to take Jesus out of the world today. They'll leave God alone, but they're going to take Jesus out of it if they can. Then they'll work on God. Because once you remove Jesus, God becomes less, in my opinion. Because you're taking away the Word. And that's our connection to God. If we don't have the Word, we're lost. Now, unfortunately, the world in the past, as well as today, people just reject that totally. They don't want to hear the Word. Have you ever tried to sell somebody the Word and they're like, no thank you? They don't. But that's God's very first step. That's not the Church of Christ's first step. That's not my first step. That's not your first step. That's God's first step, is to hear the Word. Then Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His own love towards us, as while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We must believe what the Word did. And that means that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us where we weren't even conceivably thought about. Think about it. This isn't a one time, those people right there, he's going to die for them. This was the people that came before him and came after him. You have to believe that. If you don't believe that Christ died for you, what does Christ mean to you then? You got to believe that. You got to understand Christ. You have to understand the love that he had for us. In this verse, he said, he died while we were still sinners. We've talked about this before. It's easier to die for a loved one than it is for someone on the street that you know nothing about. Or someone that you think is a sinner. Or someone you have a preconceived notion about. You know, it's a lot easier to die for your spouse your children, something like that. But Christ died for everyone. Amen. Not just good people, but for everyone. And we have to know that. But, as before, and as today, people reject that notion. Just purely reject that, that Christ died for them. Acts 17.30 Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. What does repent mean? Godly sorrow. It doesn't mean I'm going to stand up here and say, I feel really bad, Charles, that I took your cheeseburger last night. Number one, I wouldn't. Number two, I wouldn't have godly sorrow. What does that mean? It means what you've done in your life, you're going to turn. Not 360, because you're right back to the beginning, but a 180 turn in your life to where you're going to live that differently than you did before. And that means a lot. When you have that repentance in your heart and you're asking God to please forgive me for my sins, we say it so quickly in, in prayer, don't we? Please, please forgive us of our sins. Do you know how big of a request that is to God? You're requesting God to forgive you for your sins. And you have to realize one of the hardest things to realize as a human being, especially the male species of the human beings, are we were wrong. My wife's shaking her head, yes. It's very hard to admit. We are wrong. And we need to do things God's way, not our way. We were wrong. And we need to make that change. But as in past year days and as today's days, people just don't believe they're wrong anymore. They just don't. They just can't see what they're doing is hurting anything. You go to Las Vegas and spend all your house payment and you lose your house. I'll just get another one sometime. They can't see that being wrong. You can't see that happening. But we have to really repent to Jesus and to God and to just let him know. Fourth thing is Romans 10, or wait a minute, I'm, yeah, Romans 10, 9.
For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come to Sarah and shall have... That's not in the wrong one. Romans 10... I was in chapter 9. I'm sorry. Romans 10, 9. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now this is where a lot of people in the world stops, right there. I received, we knocked a door, a person knocked on our door, very nice lady. She handed us a pamphlet to a church that was starting on Saks Road close to us. And she just basically said, here's the pamphlet, if you don't have a church home, please come and visit with us. Now this pamphlet was done immaculate, had everything, and had their plan of salvation in it. And they stopped at this. Let us pray Jesus into your heart now and you will be saved. Yes, but the point of this is you need to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you know how hard that is for some people? To actually confess that Jesus is the Son of God? Because they have to accept everything up to that point. Now I've said this before, when we go to baptize someone, this seems to like to be the quickest point. Right before you want to give them, because you're so anxious to give them in the water, you do this with, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Yes, okay, let's go. That confession is huge. That is a huge confession to say that Jesus is the Son of God. Because you're accepting what Jesus has done to that point for you. And you have to realize how important that is. That confession, not only by the mouth, but that change in your heart needs to be made. And that is so important. Now the fourth, Acts 2.38, which basically says you're baptized for the remission of your sins. I won't read it. But God demands us to be baptized for the remission of sins. Why? That is where we enter into that covenant relationship with God. We first get that in touch with Jesus' blood at that point in time. We all know it represents his death, burial, and resurrection, and we say that so quickly. But to someone that has not read or studied, can you imagine how, when you go over that and you're saying, well, look at Acts 2.38, it says you must be repent, repentant or have a baptized for remission of your sins. You can't go over that that quickly. You've got to come back and you've got to stop and you've got to make them realize what Jesus has done to this point and you just confess that he is the son of God now you're being told to be baptized and that's where you come into contact with what not only the covenant relationship Jesus blood but what the Holy Spirit everything at that point comes together and that's why it's so important <clears throat> and that's when you come out and all of your sins are forgiven. For that instance, after you're baptized, you are sinless. Think about that. You're sinless. Now, it's up to the individual how long they remain sinless. But you are sinless at that point. And I just, I remember coming up out of the water. We talked about this in class. It brought back a lot of memories. And I didn't say this in class. But I remember coming up out of that water and they had this light shining down. Now, I, I don't, I'm not saying it was the Holy Spirit ascending on me or anything, but they had this light, and that's the first thing I seen was this light, and I felt so relieved, so at peace, so at calm, that I was able to climb back up on that roof and fix it and almost fell off of it. And I thought to myself, well, I guess I'm good to go if I would have fell off of it. You know, I hadn't had time to sin too much between that time. But we really, really need to make, sometimes we rush people to the water and they get wet and they don't get saved. I think that happens sometimes. I think we need to really, really focus in on making them understand these points. And then there's a sixth point. A lot of people like to stop with these five. Revelations 2.10 says to live faithfully unto death. Well, if we're not living faithfully, what we have done up to that point, God's not gonna, gonna be too happy with us in the end. And I would rather him be happy with me 
when I'm standing there waiting to go into heaven, or however we do it, I don't care as long as I'm in the right line. <laughs> don't I really don't care. I don't care if I'm at the end of it, the middle of it, I don't care. Just as long as I'm in the right line. I want him to know that I tried to live as faithfully as I possibly could on this earth. Because that's so important. It still is. But yet some believe that once you do all those steps, you don't have to do anything else. I'm good to go. I have a carnal body and a Holy Spirit inside of me. I still can do whatever I want to do. That's not what the Bible teaches. Not even close to what the Bible teaches. So we have to keep that in mind. Now I know you knew all of those steps because everybody in this room I think is baptized and have went through that steps. So you know that. But what we need to do is realize the world doesn't know that. And we can't assume they do. So we've got to be ready to what? Give an explanation of what we believe in. And this isn't what we believe. This is not nothing that we have to do with ourselves. This is what God says you must do to be saved. Is right here. That's it. Now number six is tough. But it's not as it's just as tough as number one or number two or number three or four or five. They're all tough. I'm not saying it's an easy ride. If you have lived a perfectly easy ride as a Christian, please raise your hand right now. If you've not, please raise your hand right now. Everybody's hand's going up. It's not easy. It's not. I'm not telling you it's easy. But I'm also telling you it's not the best thing in your life that you'll ever have is to be a Christian. Because it is. You will join, and we'll look at it here, a family that is tremendous. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Now I want to look at the three points to help us while we're still on this earth that will help us get to heaven. And number one is, Jesus created my church. Jesus created my church. That's in Matthew 16. And no, this does not refer to the first pope. Matthew 16, 18. And I also said to you that all, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. My is capitalized. That means Jesus' church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus created my church. It's not a man-made creation. It has nothing to do with man creating it. Not the name, not what goes on, nothing. Jesus is the leader of his church. And through the books of Acts, and if you've not read it lately, read the book of Acts, it talks about the church. It tells us when we were first called Christians. It tells us what to do with the church. It tells us how the church first was made. I wanted to read the whole book of Acts, but I pulled back a little bit here this morning. <laughs> but that's how important it is. Now, I want to stop right there and kind of step outside the sermon. This is a sidebar. I don't want to call it a soapbox, but it kind of is. But this is a sidebar. If at any time here or anywhere you're attending church and it's not teaching and preaching what the Bible says, you must stand up for the word which means you must stand up for Christ <clears throat> with an open Bible a loving heart and a humble spirit you must do it that way if you are attending a congregation not willing to use the Bible as the ultimate authority then pray seek God's help on what to do best for you because I'm telling you the point that is so much needs driven home. Each one of us is responsible for our own salvation. And if you're in the wrong place and they're teaching the wrong thing, it's your fault as much as it is anyone else's fault. 
And if you go and you humbly ask them and show them where they've made the mistake or they're not doing it and they refuse to change, you got to do what's best for you in your heart. And that's hard sometimes. Because I've, I attended a small church when I first was baptized. There was about 14 people, not the size that we have here, basically. They were all older people, and it hurt me when I returned and they no longer existed, basically. There are just a couple people left that still assemble. You get attachments to where you're at. Almost as much attachment as to the seat you sit in. You know, my, that padding where I sit at is perfectly formed for me to sit there. I'm uncomfortable when I sit somewhere else. But we get comfortable. Don't allow your being comfortable to interrupt your salvation. All right, let me step back in the sermon now. Sidebar over. You need to seek out a church, the one true church that Jesus created. Being in Jesus' church will be the best way to walk through life. No other way to get through this world. Now, I want to, want to clarify something here. If you follow God's plans and step and you are added to, you are immediately added to the church. If you follow what I talked about first, that's why I went through all of them. You're added to the church. That tells us in Acts 2, chapter 2 at the end, they were added daily as those that were being baptized. That is there. But if you are attending a church on this earth at this time, you've already been added to him. But if it's not the right church, you need to find the right church. You need to be with the right church, and that's the people, the right people to be with. A name on the building doesn't always mean something. It's sad, but it doesn't always mean something. You've got to be with the right people. Now, number two is, I'm going to talk about the right people, the brothers and sisters. I want to read several passages on this first before I talk a little bit about it. So if you want to turn to John... Folks, I'm teaching John on Sunday morning, so you might hear a lot of sermons when I preach on John, because that's where my mind is right now. John 13. Thirty-four and thirty-five. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 4, 7 and 12. John 4, did I mess this up? All right, I messed that up. I apologize. Oh, that's 1 John. That's why I messed it up. Doug, that's your fault because you're teaching on First John. Like I said, I can't be wrong, so. I apologize for that. Didn't raise my hand, right? First John 4, 7 and 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Hebrews 10.24. We often like Hebrews 10.25, but I think Hebrews 10.24 is even better. Hebrews 10 24 and let us consider one another in love to stir up love and good works and lastly Romans 12 Charles and I were just talking about this outside for those that don't know Charles and I read this for I think 50 straight days together and made sure we did it love this chapter I was told this is somewhat called the mini Bible so, Romans 12, 9 through 13. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. 
Be kindly in affection to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference and to love to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervor in spirit, and serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patience and tribulation, continually steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Our relationships with our brothers and sisters bring so much to our lives. It took me a long time to realize that. I'm not going to kid anyone. It took me several years to realize that. And I look at those years, those five or six years, as wasted years because I didn't understand how important brothers and sisters were. They make this life such an easier road to hoe sometimes. Amen. Without that, I don't know how we would get through. Number one, love. <clears throat> True brothers and sisters have love for you. They care for you. You should not feel alone if you have brothers and sisters. You should be able to call someone. It's comforting to know that others are going through exactly what you're going through and they can help you through it. Sharing. <laughs> Some of the stories that we have shared with people and they've shared with me, I treasure them desperately. And more, and they just, your brothers and sisters help you along the journey. If you're not there, they wonder where you're at. If you're not there for a little while, they're going to find out where you're at because they have all that loving and caring. Today we come together as sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We are a family of God's people and that is so important. Being part of that family, I feel God has blessed me here with each and every one of you. I really don't know sometimes how I'd make it through without you guys. I have no idea. All right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop this before I break down and start crying and not be able to finish the sermon. That's a sermon. But I know that would make some of you happy, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I want to go ahead and finish with point three. This point is going to be very much, instead of the whole books of Acts, I'll be re reading Acts 6 and 7 today because I feel this is important. Because this shows a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remember, this is not a story. This actually occurred. This is a true life event between a man and Jesus. So if you'll turn with me now to Acts 6, and just hang on as I mispronounce many words that you guys will forgive me for. I've already told God I was going to do it, so he knows it. Now in those days, when the number of disciples were multiplying, those arose a complaint against the Hebrews of the Hellenistic because of their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desired that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, when we, whom we may appoint over this business. We, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And saying, then the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parninius, and Nicol Nicholas, and the proselyte from the, a proselyte from Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great works and signs among the people. And there arose some from the, what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, Syrians and Alexandrians and those of Sicilia and Asia disputing with Stephen. 
and they were not able to resist the wisdom of the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face of an angel and saw his face as a face of an angel. Yes. Chapter 7. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Cardinians and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which no, which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But when Abraham had no children, he promised to give it to him for a possession and his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs becoming envious sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and developed him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no substance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first and second time and the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all of his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died. He and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought with a sum of money from the sons of Hamar, Hamar, and the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise, promise drew near with God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose and did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with all people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time Moses was born and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in the words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared in two of them. He appeared to two of them, and they were fighting and, treated, and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he, did, but he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you the ruler and judge over us? Do you not want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then, that, then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of 
Midian where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near, he observed the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for this place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groanings, and I have come down to deliver, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be the ruler and deliverer by the hand of an angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after they had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up you from a prophet like me, from your brethren him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the, with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, Make us a gods to, be, to go before us, as for Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the hosts of the heaven, as written in the book of the prophets, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of our god Remphan images which are made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the temple of witnesses in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers having received in it turned, also bought with Joshua into, into the land of possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house ye will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all things? Now here's where it gets really, really, really tough speech. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so, you know, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. You have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. I want to stop right there. I read all this for this point. Stephen stood there and he told the people what they already knew. He gave a history lesson to them basically yeah, that's, right. that's what it is and then he says you have ignored what you knew is right because when he uses you stiff neck and uncircumcised heart in the ears yeah. and ears oh my goodness now remember this is Stephen standing up to the most powerful people that he could stand up to they did. now what did they do in verse 54 when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Mm -hmm. I know you're telling me the truth. I'm not going to accept it. I could just see it. You could see their veins popping out on their necks. You could see that. But, being, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God 
and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see heaven, heavens opened and the Son of Man standing, I can't emphasize that enough, standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. Wow. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen. And as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And he had said this, and he fell asleep. Now I want to look at some points here. I'm going to say Stephen was very well educated in the Bible or in the old scriptures. And had that relationship with Jesus. That's what we should have. We should be very well educated in the Bible. We need that to have that relationship with Jesus. And Jesus, uh, Stephen stands firm on the truth throughout. He pronounces nothing but the truth. And that's what we should do. Even if we're confronted with high authority people that are willing to take us down, our, our relationship with Jesus should be one that we will always stand up for the truth. Verse 54 this is where he does not give one inch not one inch he sees those rulers gnashing their teeth and getting very upset and very mad but he doesn't give an inch and that means we can't give an inch either not one inch in 55 it shows that he is full of the spirit we need to live our lives and show that we are full of the spirit we need that to have that relationship with god and Jesus returns that relationship. How am I saying that? When Stephen looked up to heaven, it doesn't say Jesus was seated at the right hand of God. It says he was standing and looking. Yeah. He was standing. That's the relationship I want with Jesus, is that he stands up and looks down upon me in my time of travel, in my times of trouble, I'm sorry. I want him, I want that relationship that Stephen had where Jesus was willing to stand up and look down. Can't find that too many places in the Bible. He was standing. Stephen never wavered even as he was cast out of the city. Amen. Now, I don't even think it was very hard for them to cast him out of the city. I think they just kind of shoved him and he went because he had done everything mm -hmm. that he had to do. And in Stephen and Jesus' relationship, we now see the Saul. And what does Saul hear later on? Let me remember that Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus was being persecuted right along with Stephen. Again. And he called to Jesus. He called to Jesus. He didn't call for help from any one human being. He called to Jesus. We need that relationship. He was Christ-like even under extreme persecution. Yes. In verse 60, what did he do? He asked them basically for forgiveness as Jesus did on the cross. He asked for that. He had that relationship. In verse 10, this is my opinion. Strictly my opinion strictly my opinion I think Jesus had mercy on Stephen and let him fall asleep so he didn't have to endure the rest of the torture that's my opinion but I think that's what it was that's the relationship that they had G Stephen had done everything perfectly up to that point and I think Jesus took mercy on him so what a relationship they had and that's what an inspiration to us to develop that type of relationship with Jesus we need today that's why I read that many scriptures at the end, was to show how powerful that is. We started out today to look at a question, what are you seeking? And as I said earlier, what it doesn't matter what people think they are seeking, they truly need and truly desire a relationship with Jesus. 
They really need that. Now, we know most won't accept to have that relationship. The few that do is going to be blessed beyond comparison to have that relationship. I gave God's plans and three points to make it easier to find a way to heaven. And I said, only you are responsible for your own salvation. So if at this point in time, your relationship with Jesus is not where it's supposed to be, there's no greater time than right now to come forward and to make that relationship right. Because we are not guaranteed another moment on this earth. The lesson is yours, and I am so thankful to have a relationship with Jesus. If you need anything, please come as we stand.